Distinguished guests, now we come to the final part of our uh, meeting, and that is we connect the two, that is to say Q&A of the second uh, session, as well as uh, the evaluation uh, part. Now, before going into the Q&A, again, I would like to underline what a number of uh, speakers uh, at this panel and at the first panel uh, mentioned that we are talking of the Caucasus with maybe more focus on the south, uh, southern part, South Caucasus, but the five nations that are part of it, that is to say, at the core, as it was mentioned by our Georgian colleague, uh, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, then Russia and Turkey are all represented here. Uh, so that is a very good occasion to maybe put into view uh, the overall uh, complex situation from every involved country's point of view. But I also want to mention as an introduction to our overall uh, picture what Ambassador Lutem uh, mentioned at his uh, opening remarks that at AVIM, the Eurasian Studies Center, how we see is an evolving world picture. That is to say the economic as well as political weight, gravity, moving from Euro-Atlantic, shifting from Euro-Atlantic to Asia-Pacific. That is to say, an emerging China, an emerging East, and as well as an established West, where what we call the Caucasus and what also Turkey and Iran are becoming is more a center to this new evolution uh, of the power world, global uh, uh, power shifting. And if we want really to be a bridge, a nexus from Asia Pacific to Euro Atlantic, and which is becoming happening, we need to first come to terms in a smaller scale in the Caucasus among ourselves. This is, this is, and so this is the broader vision of what we are discussing here today, not only a regional cooperation, regional peace and stability, but what that means in such a global uh, shift. And uh, from, with this view in mind, now the floor, uh, the floor is open for any questions uh, from the floor. Ambassador, please. Ambassador Korkut. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, as an old Minsk man, uh, I want uh, to express, uh, with your permission, uh, uh, very briefly uh, uh, some views I gathered from all these excellent presentations. Uh, when there is will, of course, everything is possible. But we are facing, obviously, a very complex situation, just as you stressed. And there, as Mr. Grigosyan uh, stressed, behaviors, first of all, is very important, the psychological aspect. And there, there has been an effort, but uh, it is not sufficient, and it has to be improved. Bilateral relations help. Then there are good examples in the region. It has. They have all been mentioned already. 
But uh, uh, I think we have to deal, first of all, with the immediate problems. Leaving aside the old contested, deeply contested problems. And we should do also uh, some storm controlling. It doesn't help. Storms never help. <laughs> and uh, uh, being a Minsk man, I have also some uh, uh, concerns about the Karabakh problem, which is, in fact, the main stumbling block we are facing in the region. And uh, uh, I never understood the reasons which led the Armenian side to launch an offensive in the spring 93, just as we had agreed on the terms of reference of the observers to monitor the cessation of hostilities. I remember very well one of your colleagues, Mr. Liberadian, for instance. We celebrated the, that day all together uh, 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 this uh, event. It was a small step, of course, but a promising one. N in the next session, the occupation of Kelbecher happened, and the offensive continued, resulting in the occupation of the 20% of Azeri territories. This fact deepened the crisis, opened a wound between two neighboring peoples, changed, changed the nature, nature of the conflict. and created a deadlock. And this deadlock, since 93, more than 20 years now, is poisoning the region. I think that some gestures are needed. It, such gesture, will be a catalyzer to open the relations. That's all I wanted to say. Thank, thank you very much, Ambassador Korkut. We have Ambassador Yildirim there. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank all the distinguished speakers for their excellent presentations, which all of them are very stimulating and inspiring. I have uh, two points to make. One will be addressed to uh, Dr. Malachenko, and the other point will be addressed to all the speakers. Uh, when Avim organized last month a conference on Nagorno-Karabakh, there was an American speaker, Glenn Howard, he was the president of the Jamestown Foundation. I think this foundation is preoccupied with trans-Caucasian uh, issues. And he said that uh, in the American circles, there is now a new approach comparing the annexation of uh, Crimea by Russia to nagorno karabakh annexation of nagorno karabakh by Armenia. So this is some kind of a tilt from the American point of view, uh, towards the Karabakh issue. 
I wonder if in the Russian political circles uh, there is any kind of comparison with annexation of Crimea and the annexation of Nagorno-Karabakh. That is my question to <laughs> distinguished Russian delegate. And <laughs> my other point, I spoke on this with uh, Mr. Gregor Sian and he approved uh, my proposal. Uh, thanks for smiling. And uh, as you will all remember, there was a Transcaucasian Republic in 1918. And His Excellency the Ambassador of Georgia mentioned that Germany was involved, but in fact, it was established through the collaboration of the Ottoman Empire. And it lasted for about 19 months. And Professor Mitatpe is an expert on that republic, I believe. And uh, a grandfather of one of my classmates was also in that, an Ottoman diplomat, was in that, uh, the establishment of this Transcaucasian Republic. So we already have a model in the past of the Trans Southern Caucasian Republic. But how to apply this former model towards the new world, I have a, a suggestion. Because I was in the beginning of the OSC conference in Geneva for two years. So, and the security and the cooperation model was also applied in Central Asia, I think. One of our friends is an expert on that. So why don't we apply this a new security and uh, economic cooperation conference in southern Caucasia, but have it very limited. I mean, not open to every country, but these three involved countries, uh, Turkey, Russia, and Iran, of course, which is not a member of OSCE, and also United States and uh, just a representative of European Union, not all the European Union members. Of course, we can have also as full members the OSCE Secretariat and the MIS Group Secretariat. And the other organizations may, may be observers, like the Black Sea Cooperation Secretariat, the Caspian Sea Cooperation Secretariat, and other related international organizations like, not NATO, because this shall not be, I mean, during the USCE, there was, of course, in the political, there was military, because there were three baskets there, political, economic, and cultural. For example, in the cultural field, there are also many cooperations, like, for example, uh, there is a platform of Turkish-Armenian film producers, perhaps Mr. Gresha will know. And uh, my daughter, who is a filmmaker, they made a film with an Armenian girl, and it won the best prize in Cannes Film Festival uh, for the short film section. And then for economic cooperation, Mr. Uh, Watov uh, mentioned that Azerbaijan offered natural gas to you. So, I mean, it shall be easy to move in the economic and cultural field more easily than the political ones. Even the OSCE process finished in 10 years. It started in 1972 in Helsinki. And it lasted all over Europe, I mean, Geneva, Madrid, Vienna, wherever, I mean. But it was, I think, a, a fruit of uh, the detente. And also, so we can have this detente in this region with only the related countries, not, I mean, other people intermingling. And if with goodwill, as at least it can give a momentum to peace and the new stimulus to forward cooperation. I don't know if the other delegations, uh, distinguished speakers, would have anything to say on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I will take the questions in three. So, uh, Dr. Nika Chitsadze, please, please. I mean, in threes, and then we'll. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for all my presenters for so interesting presentations. Uh, with the permission of the distinguished audience, I have uh, three questions. First, to uh, Dr. Malachenko. Uh, it's uh, partly concerns, maybe, South Caucasus, but uh, you mentioned here about the collaboration between Russia and China. 
and um, your point of view about uh, the future of Shanghai uh, cooperation uh, organization because from one side uh, there are some coincidences of the interest of Russia and uh, China that uh, uh, somehow Shanghai cooperation organization is somehow maybe anti-Western, anti-Atlantist bloc. But from the other side, uh, we know that the volume of the trade between China and USA prevails 300 uh, billion US uh, dollars. And in your point of view, uh, does this uh, um, organization have a future? And the second question related to the Commonwealth of the independent states, taking into consideration uh, that uh, different foreign policy priorities of the countries within the CIS, I mean, uh, preparations, the foundation of uh, uh, Eurasian, is, uh, Eurasian Union, from the other side, Ukraine, Moldova, intent by this way um, uh, to uh, join European Union, uh, Azerbaijan has more balanced policy, Turkmenistan is neutral. Does the CIS in this case uh, have a, a future in your point of view? Uh, the second que question to um, uh, Dr. Hajizada uh, related to future of Guam. Because uh, I think that after the Crimea issues um, that, uh, uh, and um, also intention of Moldova, Georgia and Ukraine uh, to be more integrated in Europe after the signing of associate uh, agreement uh, and coincidences of the interests also Guam member countries related to territorial integrity issues, Eurasia transport corridor, that this organization have a future and perspectives by this way, yes, okay. So, and um, uh, my third question related to um, uh, Professor Celikpala, related um, the, uh, the role of the North Caucasus, you as a specialist, one of the best specialists related to North Caucasus, and uh, uh, by this way, influence of uh, North Caucasus on the resolution of problems in Abkhazia and Shinwali district. In case, even if, for example, Russian troops, let's imagine, theoretically, are withdrawn from the two occupied territories of Georgia, but at the same time, we know about the involvement of North Caucasus. We know about the so-called uh, North Caucasus Mountains uh, Confederation, which was fighting against uh, um, the Georgian troops on the territory of uh, Abkhazia. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, we know, for example, about the different um, um, formations, armed formations of the territory of North Caucasus. From one side, pro-Russian, such as Vostok, for example, yes, Chechen you know, Battalion, which was participating in the war in 2008. From the other side, Caucasus Imarat anti-Russian, by this way. Also, we know about uh, uh, the problem in North Caucasus, I mean, territorial dispute between Ossetia and Ingushetia, between Chechnya and uh, Ingushetia. Also, there are some Turkish-speaking uh, people, uh, party Caucasus um, uh, origin people, by this way, and uh, so, by this way, some religious, national differences and all of, of those factors, uh, how they can affect, by this way, on the resol resolving the conflict and on the relations between North and South Caucasus in general. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for my long speech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chitadze. Now the floor is open to, for answers. Maybe we start with... I was going to say, since I was the first... <laughs> <laughs> we I, I don't think I was the uh, kind of intended uh, as a first speaker here, but uh, yeah, first of all, can I... Uh, can I return to what I uh, really uh, had cut my speech um, and um, uh, to the function of, of the South Coast before addressing just a couple of points that I, I'm picking up from your questions. Um, I mentioned that Georgia considers, uh, considers itself both as the Black Sea and the Caspian country and this is what I meant when I spoke about the opportunities uh, this is the moment when both Europe is getting more uh, conscious about the need of having direct access to the Caspian region and this is uh, and the Central Asian region and this is the moment having just returned from Astana when even Kazakhstan is alarmed enough to think of decisive measures to uh, start cooperating with other countries in order to diversify its transport infrastructure. In other words, to consolidate its independence through economic cooperation with both China and Europe. And um, this just 
would bring back the whole idea of the Silk Road to life. It wasn't just a territory that was used as a transit, it was an area where local countries uh, were participating in organizing international trade and providing security for this international trade. I think we have this great moment of opportunity to increase direct cooperation between the European nations and Central Asian, uh, Asian nations and Turkey uh, via Southern Corridor uh, and thereby provide alternative routes. It's not really alternative, but additional routes that exist through Russia. It's not going to replace Russia in any way. So as for, as for the Glenn Howard's idea of connecting Crimea to Karabakh and whether Russia would follow, I most certainly think no, because Russia does not act upon principles. Russia acts upon goals. And the goal, in my view, for Russia is to keep Caucasus destabilized, uh, in unstable, and uh, vulnerable to uh, manipulation from Russia. Any kind of solution of the Karabakh problem would be detrimental to Putin's interest because uh, it would stabilize the region in either way. Uh, we had, uh, you, you mentioned the Transcaucasian Confederation. Yes, but it is different from the Declaration of Independence in 1918. It preceded the three independent nations. Uh, there was an experiment, an attempt, which I think could be looked uh, once again, uh, this experience, in, f given a fresh look at what can be revived and how could we actually use that experience to resolve the uh, outstanding issues and give the new life to regional cooperation. Probably it's a very, very useful kind of reminder that we probably should, um, should give it a try. Uh, as for the um, general kind of uh, uh, opportunities of resolving the problem between Armenia and Azerbaijan, one, you, you, you already mentioned that, um, well, after all, France and Germany have managed it after huge bloodshed in two world wars. The problem with Armenia and Azerbaijan is that unlike France and Germany, they do not have a very powerful sponsor that would encourage these two countries to cooperate, would give them huge resources called Marshall Plan, remember? Well, not many remember, by the way, particularly in Germany, uh, that thing uh, called Marshall Plan. Uh, I'm afraid uh, Russia cannot be considered as the honest broker uh, in uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia, and Russia, unfortunately, again, I emphasize, has the opposite interest of the rapprochement and reconciliation between the two nations. Um, this is all I have to say. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the question on Guam. Um, it's. Uh, very hard to comment uh, on a matter which is a so sovereign uh, decision uh, of a country to decide whether to uh, keep membership of international organization or not. But uh, Guam itself, as, uh, as an international organization, uh, as we know, it's not a supranational organization. Uh, it did not have um, enough powers to uh, impose. Uh, its uh, decisions, uh, uh, r rules on on how sh how uh, special um, institutions of the state, government branches, they need to uh, act uh, like uh, like European uh, Commission. Uh, I don't believe they even have ever uh, issued a recommendation to the member states. It was uh, it is um, still uh, an intergovernmental uh, framework where. Uh, the um, government officials feel um, comfortable to come together and uh, in, in wider Black Sea area, Guam is one of the uh, positive signs where we, we do see security community. I, I 
I believe everyone in this room, uh, in this auditorium, would agree with me that uh, none of the Guam member states are ever expected to have uh, to solve their problems uh, bearing to uh, resorting to arms. So it's um, so if if we cannot think of a conflict between Guam countries, this is an excellent uh, news uh, observation, and that they will. Uh, this is sort of a, a regional uh, security community we need uh, probably everywhere in the wider Black Sea area. Uh, Mr. Ambassador Alef Kalish will not complain that I, I, I put South Caucasus in, in, in the wider uh, framework, which, which I think um, uh, is, is the case. It should be uh, regarded uh, as a part of the wider uh, region. Uh, we should also uh, uh, be able to, to observe and uh, Comment on on the uh, on the events uh, occurring in the in the in the neighborhood, which which has actually sometimes a chain effect on on the South Caucasus as well. Therefore, starting from Balkans to Caucasus, I think uh, all uh, cross-border uh, events are are interrelated. If I may comment um, on on uh, French uh, German uh, partnership, uh, if you allow me, um, Jean Monnet had the luxury. Of, uh, of thinking how to enhance, how to prevent future war achieved after the peace agreements. The agreement which we are missing in the South Caucasus. We hear from the news, uh, from the spokespersons of the foreign ministries that there is somewhere uh, in abstract uh, exists great peace agreement. I believe you all hear that, which uh, I am personally not uh, uh, aware of the document. I haven't seen the document. I don't believe they would make it public uh, until it's signed. I hear the calls by the Azerbaijani diplomats uh, to, to their Armenian counterparts to think uh, about the great peace agreement, which uh, uh, Honestly speaking, I, I'm not aware of. So this is different. The European integration, uh, as I said, Jean Monnet had the luxury to think how to uh, prevent future war, uh, which has uh, which, which had been completed, which was over. So, uh, but here we have an ongoing uh, war. Uh, actually, in fact, Armenia and Azerbaijan are two states. Uh, at a state of war, unfortunately. So if, if there is another example in the world where two countries started to cooperate without solving their security concerns, uh, maybe that would be a, an excellent case to go and study and try to come and bring and apply it in, in our part of the globe. Thank you. Let me say something on the North Caucasus. And the title is the future in the Caucasus. When you say the Caucasus, I don't see, uh, and I don't make any separation as the North and South. The, there is one Caucasus. It is a co sort of unified Caucasus. And it was the idea in 1918 and 1919 to have one and unified Caucasus. Uh, this was the reason why the Ottoman Empire, or the leaders of uh, Union and Progress Party, uh, to support a sort of unified structure in the Caucasus. They supported the idea, and that's true that they are uh, very uh, active in the establishment of such a kind of unified political structure. But of course they failed, but the empire itself has failed and collapsed down. Uh, but I have to say that, for example, the Mountain Republic or the, North, uh, the Caucasian Confederation of 1918-1919 and then Trans-Caucasian Confederation are all trials supported by Ottomans and Turks in those days. And I have to say that especially the North Caucasian Republic or Federation was established in Istanbul. All the leadership cadres were there in Istanbul in those days. Uh, they have, at least some of them have no chance to go back to the Caucasus and to support uh, their sovereignty against whites or reds or against Germans, British or Iran and Persians whatsoever. Uh, but they failed. Uh, the Republic, the Young Republic, Turkish Republic, uh, have to face with the reality and they decided to 
uh, establish a friendly relationship with the newly established Soviet Union, and then afterwards they ask all those leadership cut to be silent, do not deal with those political issues, or to leave the country. And then all those groups left Turkey and went to Poland uh, and Czech Republic, and afterwards, before the Second World War, they were very active uh, in all those underground movements. And I would like to link this movement to the current uh, Nikas question, uh, Mountain Confederation, or all those uh, the movements in exile of 1950s, 60s even. Uh, the first generation were the generation of 1919 and 1918, but the second generation is much more different. And of course, the divide comes afterwards. Now we have North Caucasus as an inter integral part of Russian Federation and the South Caucasus. It's very geopolitical concern. If you have North as, a, in, as an integral part of Russia, you keep the North Caucasus within Russia and leave it for future discussions or uh, rivalries and try to separate the South Caucasus with this, those independent countries and try to make those regions or countries to be part of international community. Uh, it's a sort of geopolitical rivalry. And in those days, of, especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, we have a sort of uh, diaspora discussion, in, the, in, the, in Turkey especially, North Caucasian diaspora, Circassian diaspora. And they were very active. Uh, the number is not exactly known, just because of Turkey's policies of uh, demography whatsoever. Uh, but the, 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 the estimates are up to two million. But we don't know, up to top two million Circassians. <coughs> but Circassian means in Turkey, Abkhazians, Adiges, uh, Dagestanis, some other Kumuks, other Turkic groups, all of them. Uh, for Circassians, they were very active, especially uh, during the Ch first Chechen war, partly in the second Chechen war, but the state attitude was so different, therefore I cannot say that they were active. But it was easy, for example, to support all those groups uh, by the Circassians, especially against Georgia in those days. But of course, Turkish state was pro-Georgian and they supported openly and officially Georgian territorial integrity. But the interest of Abkhazian diaspora and the Circassian diaspora was much more different. Why Circassian diaspora has supported in those days, for example, uh, Abkhazian independence because it was a chance for Circassians to have an independent state for the first time. Of course, they were aware of the fact that Russia has an influence and it is not easy to balance Russia. It is easy to play with Georgia, Tbilisi, but it is tough to play with Moscow. But it was a good chance in those days and this caused a sort of split among diaspora. Now we have a Circassian diaspora or Adige diaspora in Turkey and Abkhaz diaspora. Abkhaz diaspora is under total control of uh, Abkhazian state. They are linked with Russia, Moscow. But Circassian diaspora's issues are much more different. For example, uh, Sochi Olympics, Circassian genocide, and they cooperated, at least some part of it, cooperated with Georgia uh, last couple of years, especially after 2008 Russian-Georgian war. And now there is a big deal between those groups. And this weekend, there will be a big conference in Ankara. Uh, all those Circassian and Adige diaspora groups get together and discuss the future. Because, you know, uh, the interest is much more different. For example, for those guys, it was very efficient to have Turkish-Russian visa facilitation regime. It means you can easily go to your homeland, visit your homeland, find your family's uh, resting parts, and doing a business there. But afterwards, with Crimea, it's getting worse day by day. And especially Syrian issue contribute negatively. And you see the, 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 the area is broadened very quickly because of all those separate dispersed people or diaspora groups. And this mountain confederation, it is that. Uh, the leadership card, cadre are, are moved from the political scene and even from life. For example, Shamil Basayev, he was dead. And the commander in chief, uh, 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 Soslan Bekov, uh, passed away a couple of months ago, I think. Uh, and, and the leader, Shani Be, is out of discussion. Uh, he is not part of the internal world. And therefore, the confederation mentality or mindset removed from the political scene. But all those religious extremist groups uh, is, an, is another story. 
This is the reason why Turkish diaspora are not involved, all those groups uh, for, f from then on, but it is a little bit complicated. And it's an old story and that story for the moment, but who knows? Uh, it comes very quickly. This is the Caucasus and we have the experience of 1918 and beforehand we have uh, big Sheikh Shamil experience in the middle of 19th century. Therefore, the mood or the soul is there. And it happens and most probably diaspora groups learn their lessons and they are more balanced position now, but no chance. Well, we may discuss this a little bit unrelated. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before Ambassador, I answer your question. A very quick note about Caucasus. Well, I'm very sorry, but Chechnya is not Armenia. And Dagestan, it's not Georgia. I understand that maybe geographically, maybe from the historical point of view, indeed we can discuss the problem in the frames of some general, some Caucasus. But at the moment, it doesn't exist. When we, for instance, talk about independent, independent some, some Cherkes state, yes, well, it's a, it's a joke. I've been there a lot of times, I talked to different people. That was a certain, I would say, I'm very sorry, I don't support Putin, but in that case, it was a provocation from several, some group of some, this society and some, this idea wasn't very popular. Each republic in Caucasus, I mean in the Russian Caucasus, they attempt to solve their own some questions. If you ask me who thinks about a Karabakh in Dagestan, I'll answer you nobody. And that's true, so that's true. I don't know how it will evaluate. Even I wrote a, a, working, a working paper when I called North Caucasus domestic abroad or internal abroad of Russia. It's not Russia in the proper sense <coughs> of, but it's not Caucasia. It's a something else. And of course we attempt to understand what is it. Even it's v very difficult to compare, for instance, what, uh, Chechnya and Ossetia. What is Abkhazia? It's a part of some North Caucasus, some Caucasus, or it's a part of Georgia, from all points of view. It's problem, it's problem which badly need a, a, a theoretical, psych psychological a solution, just some, that's all. <coughs> About your question, I consider it as a joke. I put the same question to a guy from Putin's ad administration. He laughed. And he is right. Just, uh, we may call it parallel thinking or something else. We can see that Russia attempts to show that it is some permitted for Moscow, for Russia, to annex some Crimea. And what about Karabakh? We don't know. It is their problem. It's impossible. Such parallels, uh, they don't exist in their brains. I, well, I am not uh, just, I, I've, I forgot, but there is a Latin expression, a, a quote, Qualitzet Jovi non litzet Bovi. I'm mistaken, but uh, so what is permitted to a Jupiter? It isn't permitted to 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 Beth. Yeah. So, some let's forget about it. Your question, your uh, three questions about Shanghai organizations. It's a Chinese organizations for penetration to Central Asia. Some Russia, well, it is, I would say, it is a, it is a member. So next, they do nothing within their bloody Shanghai organization. <clears throat> they are planning, 10 years they are planning. I saw a lot of times they have their plans, 
but all kind of relations between China and the rest of Central Asia are based on bilateral base. At the moment, they attempt to invent a big Shanghai organization with participation Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, Mongolia, who else? I don't know. Um, um, uh, maybe Canada. I don't know. I'm not responsible. If it happens, we'll get two Shanghai's organizations. One big, normal, uh, so one small, some normal, some composed with some China and the rest of actors. And the second, well, just, I don't know. Some rather imaginative. Maybe, maybe Chinese will attempt to use Shanghai as a tool for their Silk Road. Maybe. But to understand some of them, well, it's some necessary to, to penetrate inside them. I don't understand. Uh, CIS. It exists no more. It's a symmetry of independent states. So that's all. Forget about it. How could it exist? Uh, well, so that's our some glorious past. Eurasian Union. It's, uh, I don't know. I don't know what we'll have in a couple of years. So at the moment, I consider it as a bilateral, some relations between Kazakhstan and Russia, no more. Because if you some look at our brother, some Lukashenko, I cannot, I cannot understand how it's possible to carry out such a politics, a, a, a being member of Eurasian Union. He plays his own game. More, I can imagine Eurasian Union, it's a some, something big, very big, without Ukraine and Uzbekistan. Well, I respect Armenia, I respect Kyrgyzstan, but it's not enough for some real organizations. I know that Chinese, Chinese, how could I say, they don't like it. So it, de and, and besides, some Russia pays all the time to Kyrgyzstan, to Armenia, to to Tajikistan for this cooperation on the former post-Soviet space. But some Russia pays for Crimea, Abkhazia, some Syria, <coughs> some what else? We have no money. So, uh, so I, of course, uh, it comes from Putin's ambitions to, 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 uh, to, some, to be leader on the post-Soviet space, but let's think in, in the economic frames. Well, it creates for Russia itself, more problems, they give the Moscow a certain profit. So that's all. As the last speaker standing between you and your good questions, let me make a brief point. I, let me turn down the temperature. Let's go back to the frozen conflict, Nagorno-Karabakh. And more precisely, Let's be honest, this little territory populated by 100,000 people has become the main obstacle to regional development reintegration. But why? What's the real obstacle? And there are three important factors. Armenia, Azerbaijan can't even agree on what the conflict is about. Both sides remain too far apart it's territorial integrity versus self-determination. No, neither side is correct. The compromise, the middle ground, is not acceptable to either side. Moreover, the sides are not only too far apart, but for the Armenian side, the challenge is psychology. Nagorno-Karabakh is Armenia's first military victory in over 2,000 years. It's very hard for them to climb back down. Let's be honest. For the Azerbaijani side, they may have lost the battle, but the war's not over. It's a very different perspective. The second is looking at the peace process. Let's be honest. My main criticism of the Minsk group is the fact that it's too much Minsk and not enough group. It's too closed, there's no transparency, 
The lack of information promotes disinformation and they're not doing enough to reiterate the incentives, the benefits of compromise and peace. No one is doing enough to the Armenian and Azerbaijani societies to argue this is why you should settle, this is the incentive, this is the benefit. The third reason is the G word. For many Armenians, the G word is of course genocide. Not in this context. My G word is good governance. And it's the domestic political context that matters as the real obstacle to progress over Nagorno-Karabakh. In Azerbaijan, every leader of Azerbaijan, until Ilham Aliyev, has either come to power or fell from power because of Nagorno-Karabakh. In Armenia, Nagorno-Karabakh has produced its own political elite. The last two presidents, the current and the last, have come to power from Nagorno-Karabakh and because of Nagorno-Karabakh. We're all prisoners of the rhetoric, of the propaganda. More importantly, the Russia factor. It's a dangerous mistake for us to excuse bad behavior on the part of Armenia and Azerbaijan by blaming all of our mistakes on Putin. All of the answers do not lie with opposing Putin and not all of the problems are because of Putin or Russia. Let's be honest. Moreover, it's not Nagorno-Karabakh that's really key. It's progress over the occupied territories of Azerbaijan. And yes, I'm coming from Armenia and I reiterate occupied territories of Azerbaijan. Words are important. Just as when we talk about Ukraine, we need to say that there's a war in Ukraine. It's not a conflict or a crisis. Even the stupid American diplomats should have shame in not using words in their proper context. For the Armenian side, it's the occupation of Azerbaijan, the territories outside of Nagorno-Karabakh, where there needs to be progress. What we're doing in terms of Armenia-Turkey, the Turkish foreign ministry, if you notice, has been more flexible. The official Turkish position has gone from demanding progress for five occupied territories to three to two. Currently, it's progress over one of the occupied territories to give the Turkish government the political justification to normalize relations. To the credit of Ankara, it's also demonstrating flexibility in what we define as real progress. We're willing to be flexible and rather disingenuous in arguing progress. But to be honest, we shouldn't expect any breakthrough on Nagorno-Karabakh. More importantly, the challenge even for Armenian-Turkish normalization today is not Nagorno-Karabakh, it's Syria, it's Islamic State. In other words, the Armenian issue has fallen far down the list of priorities for today's Turkey. We realize this. Similarly, its developments outside of the Caucasus, especially in Ukraine and in Moscow, which will determine the outlook for prospects and possibilities. And unfortunately, it's what's missing that hurts us most. The lack of democratic, legitimate leadership until we receive free and fair elections that produce more legitimate governments that are accountable, we shouldn't really expect much in terms of conflict resolution. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, I, would, uh, I would like to respectfully disagree with Mr. Malashenko on Abkhazian issue. I will probably make myself uh, less popular among, among many people uh, for saying this, but I think that we do not, do not need to invent uh, any uh, new bicycles for the solution in Abkhazia. The basis for the resolution of the conflict should be the international law and Georgia's internationally recognized borders together with 
internationally guaranteed wide autonomy, European style autonomy for the uh, Abkhaz people uh, within the autonomy that, already, that they already enjoyed, by the way. I would remind you that both times when Georgia was an independent nation in the 20th century, Abkhazia was recognized as a part of Georgia by the international community, by the United Nations, by Russia itself in 92. And in 1918, when Georgia declared independence, it was recognized by the League of Nations, by major international players and the Russian Federation again. And if we go and choose uh, points in history which we like most for our borders, then this would go take us to a very dangerous road. For instance, uh, Turkey might choose the uh, 17th century. What we do then? Georgia would be happy with the 12th century borders. Uh, it covered the entire Caucasus, large parts of northeastern Turkey, and parts of northwest Iran. Uh, Armenia would probably choose the first century BC. Um, so what we're going to do? Uh, why don't we stick with the internationally recognized borders and resolve the problems, the core problems that uh, created the conflicts? I think that Abkhazian issue is, is even easier than other conflicts because, like I said, Abkhazia already enjoyed the wide autonomy and being a minority within that autonomy, they enjoyed many rights that the larger groups did not enjoy. So um, going back to that situation and once again getting the reassurance and guarantees from major international players, including the European Union, uh, Russia, if it uh, would like to be the guarantor of the rights of ethnic Abkhaz. I'm not sure Russia is necessarily qualified to guarantee the rights of minorities, but still Georgia would be happy to accept that. Um, but like I said, we probably shouldn't try to invent much. We should uh, base the solution on the international law, because if we drop this notion from our radar, we are going to the Middle Ages or even worse. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Ambassador. As you see, the panel itself is in a position to generate its own discussions here. But uh, we go on with the last round of questions now. The lady, yes, please. She needs a microphone. Yeah. Microphone here, please. <laughs> Professor Ergun, please, yes. <coughs> Thank you, this is Ayça Ergun from Middle East Technical University. I'd like to thank you all for this very interesting and thought provoca provocative, actually, provocative and thought provoking presentations. Well, I'd like to add, I have two questions to be addressed to all panelists, actually. Um, would you, could you please elaborate on the relationship between domestic politics and prospects for cooperation? So as we know that in the region we have varieties of authoritarianism, we have unconsolidated democracies, we have problems in democratization or democratic consolidation. So do you see or do you conceptualize a link between political regimes or regime types and prospects for cooperation? Or in other words, do you see any link between domestic politics and prospects for cooperation? And my second question is kind of an easy one, but at the same time it's a very difficult one. What areas would you qualify as important for cooperation? I mean, what are the themes and areas can be in order to promote cooperation in the region? Thank you. Thank you very much. Then, uh, do we have a question here? Ambassador Morali, yes, please. I thought you raised your hand, so. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I will try to end up with a question eventually. Uh, let me first of all congratulate you, Stiftung and Avim, for a very successful uh, organization. And uh, likewise, the panel members for being uh, 
enlightening and provocative and everything. Thank you. Uh, I'm not a, I must confess, uh, the Armenian speaker used the term to be honest. So to be honest, I must <laughs> confess, I'm not a fully detached observer. First of all, I'm married to a Russian lady. So I have a certain inclination toward Russia. Uh, she admires Putin. Uh, I'm trying to gauge Putin's dynamics. Uh, of course, when, when we talk about Russia and the Soviet Union, it, goes by, it takes memories, take us back to our university years when we were admirers of Russian culture and Soviet socialism. Uh, then <laughs> later on, uh, as Cold War thickened, we paid dearly for that, uh, the uh, Soviet dynamics in terms of the ideological confrontation that took place in Turkey between uh, likewise Soviet socialism and American capitalism, which precipitated military interventions. Uh, but now we are <clears throat> possibly in a better situation to gauge the dynamics in Russia behind Putin and my conclusion is that Putin's driving motivations are superpower politics, superpower ambitions. He is a product of the Cold War period and Soviet imperialism and all that. Uh, so certain things which are not explicable on their own take better meaning. Again, I'm not detached to the Armenian cause. Uh, in February 72, was it? I was serving in Chicago in our consulate. Then I woke up one morning informing me that my colleague, my roommate, who was working at the Los Angeles consulate and his boss had been assassinated by, which were later on called as Yannick Yang Commandos. That sensitized us for the first time to the dynamics of diaspora. Uh, and today, still the diaspora dynamics are puzzling and uh, we are having difficulty in uh, fathoming that. I have never been in Armenia, so I am not in an authoritative position to um, analyze the effects of Armenian diaspora in, the, in Armenia proper and its political apparatus and all that. Uh, but I did serve in Baku, so I'm not a detached observer there either. I was ambassador in Baku, and at the time, people were joking about me being, having served in uh, both Tehran and uh, Baku as ambassador. That is, they were, the joke was that it was northern and southern Azerbaijan I had been ambassador to. Uh, but that was only a joke, with all due respect to Iranian colleagues, if they are here. Um, the, the thing is, when you talk about possibilities and prospects, the possibilities and prospects are screaming to our faces. And yet, we are totally blocked. The whole agenda has been hijacked. Uh, Turkey building blocks toward reconciliation with Armenia. That's, that's not realistic. So they, the, the, the possibilities, the prospects, they all come and hit their heads against the wall of real politics. In my mind, this is an intractable situation. There are no visible, easy solutions. Uh, the Russian uh, speaker referred to deaf leaders. And the question was about the relationship between leaderships and uh, uh, the politics and uh, the prospects again. Uh, so clearly, it's important what the leaderships, the driving motivations are behind leaderships. Uh, the Armenian situation is not very uh, promising. Uh, the Azerbaijani situation is different. They believe they have the time on their side. They can wait. And uh, they are earning a lot of money. The country is floating on Euro, uh, Euro, Euro dollars or gas dollars, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so the time is working in their, in, on, on the, in their favor. So it takes, it is going to take wise leadership to profit from all the possibilities. But right now, countries are engaged in a self-flagellation psychology of sorts. 
And uh, I think it's now time for me to ask a question. Uh, but one, one more point. There was a solution at Mampan one time, during Ter Petrosan time. I think the two sides were very close to a solution of sorts, uh, based on territorial exchange. Azerbaijan and Nachivan would be connected through a corridor, and equal uh, area, territory, would be uh, given to the Armenian side so that uh, you know, the, the mainland Armenia would be collected to whatever it was to be integrated to mainland Armenia. But then, that was defeated. Why it was defeated? Because of the influence of outside powers. Iran was the first to object. It didn't serve their interests. Now, Iran is a very critical, very curious question because Iran is possibly the, the second biggest Turkic nation after Turkey. At least one third of Iran is Azeri. But it was defeated by Iranian objections. Soviet Union objected because the superpower dynamics did not see that as favorable. Uh, so the chance, or the possibilities were missed. Uh, now we are left with even a more intractable situation which Turkey, which takes Turkish politics hostage. Turkey cannot overrun, over, go around those dynamics. Azerbaijan is too precious for us. There has to be an accommodation between Azerbaijan and Armenia for Turkey to open the horizons. So my question, clearly for the leaders to become more responsive, responsible, there has to be democratization. And the role of diaspora, Armenian diaspora, should be to encourage democratization. So how does the Armenian speaker see the role of diaspora, uh, hopefully detached from the gathering storm in 1915? That will certainly be a very negative setback, but hopefully we will storm through it. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Moralu. If there are no other questions, are there? If there are no more questions, then we s yes, stop. Hmm? Is there one? No, I don't see any. So then we start with the answers and then a short evaluation period after that. Thank you. We start with you this time. Thank you. Let me take the second question first. In terms of the Armenian diaspora and its potential role or envisioned role in terms of democratization and to be helpful rather than an obstacle. I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, there is no role for the diaspora. I say that as a diasporan. In other words, the good news is when then President Gul arrived in Turkey, it was immediately a victory in an important new context. Historically, it was the first ever visit of a Turkish head of state to Armenia. But the reason we welcomed President Gul, in fact, even became friendly with him later, is the fact that his arrival in Armenia meant that the initiative in Armenian foreign policy options regarding Turkey returned to Yerevan and not the diaspora. It immediately delegated the diaspora to a secondary role where it was much less important. But to answer the question, idealistically, what we need to do, we in Armenia, is to transform the diaspora in its ability to look at Armenia as the center of gravity, where it cares as much about democracy and human rights and development of Armenia as it does of April 24th or Nagorno-Karabakh. We're not there yet. And in many ways, in terms of Armenia-Turkey normalization, the diaspora is as, is as challenging to us as it is to you. Having said that, the Turkish government has a very difficult time understanding who is the diaspora, what is the diaspora, and how to engage it. 
but attempts have been made. But actually the two questions are related because in the Armenian context, it's the domestic political driver. But to be honest, in Turkey as well, it's all about domestic politics as well. In Armenia's case, it was a success of the authoritarian top-down leadership that was able to have the Armenian president sign the protocols. In Turkey as well, at the time of the protocols, it was a very small group of people in the Armenian president's office and the Armenian in the Turkish prime minister's office that implemented this. We didn't have a constituency for normalization. There wasn't bottom-up pressure. This is what we're focusing on now. But what's interesting too about the first question, your wife admires Putin. I can understand that. In Armenia, many people do. Even my five-year-old daughter admires Spider-Man and Batman, uh, which I compare the two, because in many ways, the superpower status of Putin is magical, but it's an illusion. It's not reality. And if we look at the reality of oil prices, the value of the ruble, the harm to the Russian population, it's temporary. Having said that, the reason I'm still optimistic and I do fundamentally disagree with you, respectfully, in that I am nowhere near giving up, and I see tremendous progress to date, just the fact that we're here having an open, frank discussion. Because I remember the events of Asala, the Justice Commandos, the Armenian terrorism from the 70s and 80s, and it was a tragedy we should all share and condemn openly. But at the same time, look at how far we've come from that period. And it's very hard to go backwards. I don't think even the worst intentioned militants will be able now to defeat the moderates. We're past that stage. About, about your question, economic cooperation, to where, yes? How could it be? Just so maybe I didn't understand. So maybe I forgot. But some repeat, please. Thank you. Uh, my first question was about how do you see the link between domestic politics and prospects for cooperation? Do you do you think there is a link in between, or do they support each other, or do they hinder each other? And my second question is that what are the possible areas you think as important for cooperation? So what do you think are, should be the I priorities see. for cooperation? I see. I don't know what about your first question, but about your second question, I'll, I don't believe that soon this, some cooperation will develop. Even I can say nothing about zones, about frames in which some frames it will take place. Uh, I can imagine some cooperation, a real economic cooperation between all three countries. Yeah? That's tragedy, and that's problem. But sometimes it looks like situation in Central Asia. Also, they say about necessity of some regionalism to, to cooperate in the frame of region. They did nothing. I think that the same f the fate uh, will be with uh, some Caucasus. The only one thing, oh, how by, some, by the way, uh, I don't believe that that they are able to create a certain Caucasian market. It's impossible. Maybe the only one thing that they can reach if they indeed uh, cooperate, it's uh, some construction or modernization of, of the infrastructure. They badly need it. But I don't know how it will go. And besides, I don't want to offend all three republics, but it seems that they badly need a certain outsider who will come and who will help them. Some Russia, I doubt. Who else? Some old Turkey. It's also a problem. 
but as they are now, they, they can do nothing. I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry because of a lot of reasons, even I don't want to mention conflicts. So it's a tragedy. But uh, about some your question about uh, about uh, whom a house and loves Putin. Before you mentioned culture, you pronounced the word some culture. Indeed, there is a Russian culture. But at the same time, there is a Russian political culture. And the difference between Russian culture and Russian political culture is as between a chair and elected chair. <laughs> you see? So we loved and Lenin and Stalin and Khrushchev and who else? We didn't love only Gorbachev. So I don't believe that that our love, the love of society for Putin is forever. Because look, after collapse of Yeltsin, after all kind of economic some problem, Russian society badly need a father of nation. And it came, he came, some not he came, but somebody took Putin by his hand and put on the chair of the presidency. Yes, and, and very soon he invited a huge team of his friends from KGB. And in that time when the first years of his presidency, the price of on oil began to raise. It was a happy coincidence some for him. And he became popular and so on. But I don't know, I don't know, I don't know about his fate. What he will become be in, uh, for instance, 10 years. At the moment, he openly, practically said that he will participate in presidential elections. And once again, he will be president of Russian Federation. It reminds me Brezhnev. Yeah, I would like to say some just short things to IHS questions. In fact, there are of course possibilities to cooperate and still parties are cooperating with each other. With, with each other. But we have some, some simple problem in front of this kind of cooperation or furthering cooperation. It's not just high politics related issue. Very, very technical, very, very practical. Uh, for example, we do not have the same infrastructure the banking system, customs union, uh, legal systems are not similar or not talk too close to each other to, to further our cooperation. For example, uh, Turkish, Georgian, Turkish, Azerbaijani cooperation and the prospects are important from this perspective. I am just uh, giving importance to this trilateral cooperation just because of this reason. Because with this, uh, how can I say, effort, it is possible to have a sort of similar infrastructure to further our cooperation. Then afterwards, most probably, comes other ca Caucasian countries as well, of course, with the reality of other big problems. And I don't know whether there is a con uh, connection, there is a kind of connection between regional dem 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 domestic politics and cooperation. Uh, yes or no, for example, uh, there are many countries, do, they do not have a democratic regime, but they are cooperating with each other in terms of trade, finance, whatsoever. Uh, but there are many democratic countries, they do not cooperate with each other because of some similar reasons. And all those colored revolutions in our neighboring regions showed us that time to time, democratic or trying to establish democratic structures do not facilitate or help to establish some cooperation schemes. There are some authoritarian regimes in the Caucasus, think about Turkey as well, and then we have some prospects as well. For example, if you develop a cultural kind of cooperation with Georgia, and if you prioritize to renovate all those mosques in the Black Sea coast of Georgia, then you will have nothing in your hand. But if you try to find some cultural commonalities and further your cooperation without touching those kind of negative issues, then most probably you will have some grounds. 
these are the issues, but I don't want to touch. I think it's true that not all countries in the wider Black Sea area occupy the best place in their uh, uh, democracy index uh, tables. Uh, I, I read the question uh, in that perspective. Uh, but I think uh, Professor Chalik Pala already mentioned that uh, sometimes uh, we, we have the instances where uh, democracy is not the uh, the key uh, for having uh, regional cooperation. We have the uh, ECOWAS, Western African uh, cooperation, where uh, uh, the, the governments have come together on joint threats uh, to uh, exercise their sovereign powers over the territories to cope uh, with the uh, illegal uh, military groups. Uh, so therefore, I think what areas could, could qualify for cooperation? Uh, my honest opinion is we should dig to the security and uh, energy cooperation. Uh, if, if we do not aim that, the rest, I think uh, people are, especially politicians, leaders are so aware of, uh, of um, so-called soft politics uh, first, then probably hard politics. So people are aware of, of that, um, of me methods, and uh, it's, it's impossible to, um, to do other way around. So I think, uh, like, like in the case of uh, European integration, uh, which started in the Western Europe, then spilled over to uh, Central and Eastern. Uh, it all started with energy cooperation on um, establishing supranational institutions to uh, regulate uh, uh, sovereignty. Some, some sovereignty was granted to these or organizations. Powers were delegated to, to deal with uh, common problems. So unless uh, such an uh, institution exists in, in this part of the world as well. Uh, it's, uh, it would be a little uh, not serious uh, to, to, to genuinely believe on, on the possibilities of uh, genuine cooperation. Thank you. Uh, but still, uh, just uh, I do believe that uh, exchange, uh, social mobility should exchange, exchange of uh, uh, be it um, uh, professors, students, uh, tourists, uh, so without interaction, without um, uh, uh, understanding the cultural diversity, uh, uh, there is no way, uh, there is no alternative to it. Thank you. Well, I may make a few comments. Uh, well, <clears throat> Uh, we start our discussion with what Putin does and what motivates him, what his goals are. Uh, I would only say briefly that, um, in my view, while uh, chasing the Eurasian Union dream, Putin may actually lose Russia. And, and Georgia will not be happy a bit at all about this because we will be one of the first to feel the immediate negative effects of it, um, uh, despite the very difficult uh, um, and kind of high temperature feelings in Georgia. By the way, it was very, very hard to develop negative feelings towards Russia in Georgia, uh, which never existed, even through the 19th century in the Soviet times, because when Georgians were treated badly, we all always knew that we were sharing the same fate with other peoples of the Russian Empire and Soviet Union, because Russian ethnic Russians were treated in exactly in the same appalling way. So we didn't really feel discriminated particularly. But when we saw Russian tanks and Russian bombers, I mean, this actually, of course, produced more people who, who have uh, very difficult feelings towards Russia. But again, I, I emphasize Georgia would not be happy, and no one should be happy if something really dramatic happens to Russia, in, and I'm afraid it may. Um, 
and um, I, 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 can, uh, I cannot agree more with Mr. Malashenko about the culture. We all admire Russian culture, uh, but it, is, uh, it has nothing to do with the Russian political culture. It is the exact opposite, and Russian political class, the top leadership always actually hated Russian culture, I believe, and the most prominent Russian uh, figures in the Russian culture have usually been persecuted or sometimes exterminated uh, by their leadership. Um, now, uh, Armenia, uh, I think we have been at the point of possible breakthrough in Armenia, but again, I don't want to engage in this um, uh, conspiracy theories, but I remember very clearly, I was stationed here in Ankara as a deputy ambassador of Georgia at the time when Strop Talbot uh, visited Minsk, then Moscow, then Baku, and he flew to Yerevan. And we were gathered at the French embassy at the reception when we heard the news of the shooting in the Armenian parliament, which occurred half an hour after Strop Talbot flew away from Yerevan. And you, you're free to make your own uh, conclusions, but I cannot help but connect this to, uh, again, uh, something that I mentioned earlier, Steinmeier's visit to the region, to Moscow, to uh, Sukhumi and Tbilisi, and to Tbilisi's readiness to accept the deal. And then uh, it was followed by what we know as the Russian-Georgian war. So, <clears throat> So now, possibilities of cooperation, I'm much more optimistic than Mr. Malashenko. I see much more uh, opportunities. Uh, first of all, I don't know if Mr. Malashenko is informed that uh, both Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, as well as uh, uh, Azerbaijan, are building new ports on the Caspian, uh, and major ports. Uh, secondly, uh, there is a situation that has ripened Kazakhstan, Russia's most kind of steady neighbor to actually do uh, engage in the international cooperation that before it would never consider possible because they would try to kind of uh, not to displease Russia. Now Nazarbayev has really serious, uh, he has become serious about engaging both with the, the East and the West. and. Uh, I also visited Bucharest before coming here after Astana and uh, we have increasing awareness by the Europeans of the need to diversify their supplies and their transportation routes. There is a functioning railway connection between Dusseldorf and Beijing or Western China that go through Russia and Kazakhstan. They are seriously considering uh, getting, obtaining alternative routes and this alternative route might be coming very soon, but when uh, Georgian and uh, Turkish railway systems are linked. Um, furthermore, uh, we could be looking at m greater volume of uh, energy and cargo going through this area. We need to somehow involve Armenia because um, this will remain as a kind of uh, landmine uh, under the whole setting uh, because uh, we cannot provide a safe uh, service passage for goods and uh, energy uh, if we we still are not if we are not uh, a normal peaceful stable region so i hope it happens uh, but the opportunity is there democracy um, let's let's be positive about the lack of democracy as well let's look at the opportunities that the lack of democracy in some of our countries provide because when it comes to making very painful decisions for the nations, I'm not sure uh, people normally tend to vote for painful decisions. Uh, I'm not necessarily a big fan of authoritarian regimes, but, and I'm not saying there are any, of course, in my neighborhood, uh, but if there were, wouldn't the leaders who have greater degree of power in their hands be in a better position to take very serious, sometimes painful decisions, because without painful decisions, I cannot see any progress. Um, as for interaction, this is my final remark. Uh, I will give you uh, also good news. Uh, I think interaction 
it would be a very positive uh, factor in bringing these two peoples together. And uh, we, Georgia, have a perfect venue for that. Armenians and Azerbaijanis interact in Georgia, like, by the way, Iranians and Israelis. They sit in the same casinos and nightclubs in Batumi, Kabuleti, Tbilisi, um, and they, they get along extremely well. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I see that we are running out of time, but nevertheless, I think we have come to the conclusion, and I must thank all the speakers for their very interesting inputs uh, to this session and uh, the first session we had in the morning. Uh, now that uh, I see in the program an evaluation, I'll just, uh, I have taken some notes here as headlines. I'll put them on and if there are uh, any comments from the panelists, of course I'm ready uh, to hear their views. But what I have as an evaluation uh, taken note here is that one, there is conflict potential in the region. Two, status quo is seen by some as the better of the two evils. However, status quo ends up to be a zero-sum game. Cooperation obviously is a win-win. And there does exist cooperation even if it's exclusionary. However, exclusion is not the desired option. And I sum it up all with our Georgian colleague. I think we need to have more trust in ourselves. <coughs> so thank you very much. And if there are no comments, then we conclude the meeting. But before doing that, uh, I also would like to uh, reiterate, like the previous speakers, our deep thanks for cooperation uh, to the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and uh, in uh, person, uh, Dr. Colin Durkop uh, for the very generous uh, assistance he gave to us and we hope that we will have more such occasions in the future. Thank you all very much for your attendance and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just one moment. I think I think we we have we have something starting with uh, doc, uh, Dr. Durkop. <laughs> something from Avim just to remind you of this meeting. A souvenir, very very simple one, but nevertheless. A